I have six Proverbs for you today. We are in the 19th chapter and we'll cross over into chapter 20. We're at 1926 and Lord willing, we'll finish at 20 and verse 2 this morning. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. We are blessed for our mothers. 1926, the person who ruins his father driving out his mother is a shameful and disgraceful son. 27, cease my son listening to instruction in order to stray from the words of knowledge. 28, a corrupt witness mocks at justice and the mouth of the wicked swallows iniquity. 29, Punishments are established for mockers and beatings for the back of fools. 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler, and everyone who staggers by them is not wise. And our final proverb, 22, the roaring of a lion is a terror struck by the king, Whoever angers him forfeits his life. Here is the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs, what I believe the exhortation for us should be. 26, children can break your heart. Children can break your heart. 27, Keep your children always listening. Keep your children always listening. 29. A healthy society punishes the mocker. A healthy society punishes the mocker. 20 verse 1. Practice your freedom with wisdom. Practice your freedom with wisdom. And 20, verse 2, flee the wrath of the lion. Flee the wrath of the lion. Okay, here is our exposition beginning in 1926. The one who ruins you may have robs, does violence, assaults, mistreats. His father driving out his mother is a shameful and disgraceful son. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, the Ten Commandments. The law of Israel stated that children were to honor their parents. And this is a child that does not. It's the consequences to a child-rearing process in which a home had no wisdom and had no guidance and had no leadership, Father, in the home. This opening top line, the one who ruins, is identified in line two by behavior. Look at this. Shameful and disgraceful. To ruin here in the top line is translated, interestingly, in Proverbs 11.3 as unfaithful. The King James says perverse. The word means to mistreat, to handle badly, cruelly, roughly. I thought it was interesting in Isaiah chapter 15 and verse 1. It is translated in the English Standard Version to lay waste. It is a reference not to the city, the structure, but rather to the people, the harsh treatment given to the people personally. This proverb is an echo of our previous verse 13, the word destruction, the child who destroys. 
The ruin, line one, is directed to the Father as the ultimate agent or object of the wrongdoing. See, uh, driving out, fleeing, that's used in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 8 of Hagar telling the angel of the Lord that she is fleeing away from her mistress Sarai. So the word carries the idea of a takeover, a usurping of authority. That's what the child is doing to his parents. Uh, Cicero, the Roman philosopher, historian, said, when I hear the child curse, I go slap the father. That's the idea here. So, these words together carry the picture of children forcibly evicting their parents from property. This child is an imbecile, shameful, disgraceful. How he destroys his parents, the proverb doesn't tell us. It could be sloth, it could be riotous living, uh, all kinds of various and sundry crimes, but make no mistake, we don't know, but what we do know is his future. He doesn't get away with anything. Children are like uh, we see in the Old Testament, overt behavior that brings about calamity to the family. Genesis 26.35, Esau's Canaanite wives that he brought in to the family. They brought sadness, hardship to the tents of Isaac and Rebekah. 1 Samuel 2, the family of Eli the priest was cut off and cursed from the priesthood because of the behavior of his sons. We're all familiar with the disobedience and hatred among the children of David. It reaches its zenith, 2 Samuel 15. Absalom so hated his father that he not only wanted to dethrone him, he wanted to kill him and kill him personally. So if any is wise among us, we certainly know what this proverb is doing. It's warning the parent. It's warning particularly the father. Be teaching your children. Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.2 Understand this, said the apostle, in the last days terrible times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, and finally disobedient to parents. Two points of testimony for me personally in regards to this proverb. After I was saved, I came under conviction very early in my young Christian life of what a scoundrel I had been as a son. My parents didn't see it, but I knew it. And so came that day when I had them sit down and I formally apologized to them for the way I had lived my life. I look back on that and it was a great moment, even though I wasn't trying to be wise. It turned out to be a great moment because for the first time I think my father saw that this wasn't a phase I was going through. This was real. And this was the person that I had become. And from that point forward, he took a real interest in spiritual things and began to come to Believer's Chapel. The second point that I will never forget, second marker for me personally regarding this proverb, I set my two children down individually alone and I apologized to them for the way that I had raised them, uh, for my hypocrisies, my inconsistencies, and particularly in regards to my daughter who uh, I struggled with uh, because she is different. 
uh, emotionally than I could relate to. She was on Pluto, I was on Venus, or something like that, and never to, did the two meet. But I apologized. And I have a clean conscience toward my children. Uh, your children are not looking for perfect parents, but they are looking for real parents, genuine and consistent in your faith. Keep the sharpest edge on your personal testimony. That will make the biggest impact on their lives. Here's 27. Cease. It's a command. My son, listen to instruction. It's not enough to just listen to a lecture uh, on wisdom, counsel. It takes a lifetime to learn, to apply, to walk in. The need of the Scriptures daily is always to keep our thinking straight. And we are naturally depraved. So we need to constantly be absorbing, processing wisdom in our minds. The truth. To not be conformed. That's Paul's thought. Romans chapter 12. To the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The Bible study hour under Jim Boyce. His theme, to think, comma, and act biblically. There it is. It's information processing that leads to a walk. Uh, Alistair Begg, Reformed Presbyterian. His theme is the learning, comma, is for living. It's content. It is doctrine that works itself out into the practice, the daily life. Our top line, cease, refrain. Our verb is listening. The Lord's words, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 15. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Words, wise utterances used throughout the Proverbs. Line 2, here is the real sarcasm. If you drop that, if you are not giving that out, so to speak, it, your translation has it as a result. He who does not listen will stray. That's the result. I see it more as a purpose clause as a word of sarcasm back to the parent because the command, the proverb begins with a command. Cease. Don't cease. That's the point. If you do, these are the consequences that happen. And when you cease, then the child strays. That's what you see here. Uh, drifting is the idea. Genesis 33, 18. Jacob pitched his tent before the, before the city of Shechem when he got back into the land after his time with Laban. Why didn't he move on? He didn't. It was a major blunder in his life. He was drifting. I'll never forget several years ago, Dan Duncan's sermon entitled Drifting. It was about this period of Jacob's life. Here's the idea. You jump in the ocean and you've got a reference point and then suddenly you look up and you're far from that reference point where you dove in. What happened? Well, the silent current had gotten a hold of you and drug you down the beach. You didn't feel it, you didn't know it, but in reality, you've strayed. That's the idea. Like a lost sheep wandering away. So here's the end of what you strayed from. Look, it's knowledge. The knowledge of God. What we talked about last lesson. It is life or death in a proposition. If a man does not possess the knowledge of God, then he's never going to get on the right path. Never. Here's 
classic illustration of it. Uh, man considers man the measure of all things. So when we begin with our education, we begin with anthropology, man, because he's the measure of all things. So what does man do? Well, man creates the science of zoology. And what is it? It's evolution. It's the natural process. That's the way we were all educated. But where did the science of zo zoology really begin? It began in the garden. God created the animals. He brought them to man in order for him to name. You see, you'll never get to the knowledge of God by starting with man. True north is the Scriptures. And that's why we're here to learn them. Here's 28, a corrupt witness mocks at justice. Another proverb condemning the false witness, the corrupt witness. Oh boy, haven't we seen these in so many places. A real revolutionary against a fair society. Here is... Mocking at justice. Justice, the word means ruling, legal decisions, judgments. The corrupt witness is the worthless fool who, for whatever reason, a bribe, mocks justice by lying. That's what you had in 1 Kings 12. The, the story is a, a display of the power of the witness in Israel. According to the law, here's line two. The mouth is the member of the body that does or is given over to the wickedness of the lie. And observe, although your translation reads it in the singular with wicked, it's actually in the plural. Now why is that important? Well, it's important because that little plural fits perfectly with the law. You see, the law is established as truth with two corroborating witnesses. So, wicked is in the plural because they have to be two in order for the law to be established. The wicked, they live out every day in thought, word, and deed as fools. And the Scriptures call that folly. Living your life unaccountable to the living God. That's folly. Disadvantaging others, always advantaging yourself. That is life. And that's the life of the fool. Now, look at this interesting figure, swallows. The Greek translation of the Old Testament translates it drinks down. Commentators have focused on this figure of swallowing and have come up with two ideas. The first is one is being devious about the truth, therefore he swallows it down. Now it's gone. Can't find it. It's hidden. The second is it renounced to one's personal pleasure. Swallowing, ingesting, taking it down. Now we can't find it. And now it brought that person a great deal of pleasure in order to do it. Um, what caused a person to lie? Well, proverb doesn't tell us money, power, hatred for the one that they are lying about. Who knows? But here is what we know for certain. Look at this. See the word iniquity? That's gross injustice. Let me give you a proverb. 22.8 The sower of iniquity. That's our word. The sower of iniquity shall reap trouble. It's a future certainty. You see, you get away with nothing 
by lying. You swallow it, but you're swallowing the iniquity. Now it's there. It's within you. It's on you. It is you now. And the wages for what you have done, well, the proverb says, are right around the corner. Here's 29 punishments. Your translation may read penalties. Judgments are established for mockers and beatings for the back of fools. There's a natural fit between punishment and fools in the Proverbs. The top line, punishment is literally rods of correction used 16 times in the Proverbs and in the plural. So it's beatings to satisfy the law. Agents administer justice. And the agents are God-approved and God-appointed, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13. I came across this during the pandemic in my reading. Ezekiel 14.21, it specifies particularly agents that the Lord uses. I thought it was interesting. One is sword. That's warfare. The second is famine. Now we can't feed ourselves. The third is wild beasts. You know, God turns the beast upon the man. And we saw that in Daniel's lion's den, didn't we? But here's the fourth that really got my attention. An agent that God uses for His purpose. Pestilence. Pestilence. Plague. Microscopic virus. See, the Lord is communicating to the world. Look at this established, fixed, immutable, eternal decrees. Psalm 11, verse 2, it's used of an arrow being fixed to the string of a bow. It's established, it's fixed, it's set in place. Nothing occurs by chance. If you hear someone say, well, I'm just lucky, well, you're just listening to intellectual atheism. There's no such thing as luck or chance. No. Such language we expect from, look, look at your proverb, the mocker. There he is. And the and in line two connects the mocker to beatings. You see that? Caning by human hands, divine judicial providence. Forcing out acts of judicial justice. Our previous proverb, verse 25, said, When you see, when the naive see the mocker punished, suddenly he becomes prudent. What's that mean? Shakes him up. Really shakes him up. That's why a society needs to incarcerate and discipline lawbreakers. And they should feel the full force and brunt of the laws. Here's 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler, and everyone who staggers by them is not wise. Wisdom requires clear thinking to make conscious decisions. The drunkard lacks conscious self-control here. The emphasis is to is bad characteristics of drunkenness. We see that in morality, decorum, in propriety in our society. The term beer and wine, both intoxicants, are actually personified, look at your proverb, as villains, mocker and brawler. The proverb is to the child, warning of the transforming nature of these elixirs. Be careful, they don't necessarily make you attractive. The top line, wine here, is obviously alcoholic, as it is in all the Scriptures. To argue that wine is non-alcoholic defies logic. 
uh, Paul. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. The prohibition is to not let these intoxicants have free reign and rule in your life. That's the point. The final words of the proverb is not wise. The word beer has 22 occurrences and with wine, 20. It has a broad interpretation associated with barley, a light intoxicant compared to a stronger drink called in the top line as a brawler. The lexicon actually translates this word as boisterous, turbulent. Now I'm going to give it to you and you'll never forget it again. Here it is. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters, and there's our word, brawler, translated roar and foam. You see, they're boisterous waters. They're turbulent waters. And that is the brawler of our proverb. 20 verse 1, the idea is being rancorous, noisy, restless. He disturbs peace. He disturbs justice. Line 2, the and... Now, if you have an NIV, it's unfortunate that they left the and out of the proverb. These connectives are really important. And it's left out of the NIV. The and is important because it gives the consequences and the conclusion to the proverb. Everyone, the word implies the entire group, all inclusive. Nobody is eliminated. Staggers, literally, becomes drunk. That is the word that's used of Noah in Genesis 9.21. He staggered. The final two words, look, not wise. When you lack the skill for living, you're virtually directionless in life. You're directionless for living. The danger of alcohol is no different than being addicted to anything else in the flesh, as we're fleshly people. Here's the wise apostle regarding that matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul says, All things are lawful to me, but not all things are profitable to me. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So, wine in the Bible is a blessing. Wine in the Bible is a curse. Alcohol is a shame to Noah, but in the hands of Melchizedek, the priest of Salem, it brings a great blessing to Abraham. The issue is not the content of the cup. The issue is the attitude of the wise man. Here is the counsel from the proverb. Be careful. So what's my interpretation to you? I treat you like mature people. The Bible is not do's and don'ts. You're free in the Spirit. Act wisely. Act maturely. Now let me give you a quick illustration. Back in 1950, Someone gave to the Dallas Seminary a ping-pong table. And it wasn't long before the students began to have tournaments, play one another, and so forth. It just so happened at that particular time at the seminary, one student was a grand champion ping-pong player. And he beat everybody. And finally couldn't get a game, so he's right-handed, he starts playing with his left hand. But he still beats everybody, so 
Finally, he ends up playing with a Coke bottle. Now, there came that day in the middle of one of these great tournaments that he just stopped. He put the Coke bottle down, put the ball next to it in one of those grooves, you know, from those old Coke bottles, and he walked away. And his testimony to Dr. Hendricks 10 years or so later, I haven't been close to a ping pong table in over 10 years. Now, I challenge you. Read every line of the New Testament. You will not find a prohibition against ping pong. But you see, for him, for him, it was a sin. And following the apostles' words, he wasn't going to be mastered by anything. A free man, free to play ping pong, but not for him. And that's wisdom. That's your proverb. Here's 20, verse 2. The roaring of a lion. Our top line is very similar to 1912. The king is a powerful person in the ancient Near East. I don't think we get our brains around that enough because we're in a democratized society. But the king alone had the power of life and death by his own voice. He didn't consult with anybody. He didn't need to. He just spoke. And there it was. And the figure of the lion here emphasizes the danger of dealing with the king. So in conjunction with the previous proverb, we could say the brawler, the drunkard, is handed over to the king. I don't think that's the point, but it gives you an idea. Uh, We're familiar with some of these words, the top line, the roaring of the lion. Previously, we had the word in our studies, fury. Now it's going to give way to the word terror, the terror of the fool. Terror in the Old Testament occurs 16 times. It's a sharp, intense feeling of fear. Here it is in a text that you're probably very familiar with. Genesis 15, God had commanded Abram to prepare himself for a covenant with him. So he rose early that day, and he killed animals, and then he split the carcasses in two on each side, east and west, so that they could both walk down through the carcasses together. That's the idea. What transpired that day was something quite different. Abram diligently did the work, and then he waited. He waited, he waited, he waited, he waited all afternoon. And the text says that he was driving the birds of prey away from the carcasses so they wouldn't hinder what was about to take place. Then you come to Genesis 15, 12. And the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, and here is our word. Our word from our proverb. Terrifying. A terrifying darkness fell upon Abram. That's our word. Miriam uses it in Exodus 15, 15, the song of Moses. As the other nations and kings heard about Israel's triumph in the Red Sea over Egypt, Exodus 15, 15, Miriam sings, the chieftains and of Edom and Moab were dismayed. That's our word terrified. Dismayed, come on. That's white tablecloth language. They were scared out of their wits. That's the idea of the word. Line two, whoever, see, we're not going to discriminate. We think of Haman who was the king's close associate. And I thought about this in preparing this lesson. A life of folly, Haman, 
you know, always scheming, always, I got to get in lane one. I'm in lane four. Uh, now I'm in three. Uh, I got to get to lane one. That's the life of folly. And what struck me about this use of Haman is suddenly, as in a moment, it was over. It was over for him. All the cards were stacked against him in a moment. And he never saw it coming. He never had any idea. You see, that's living in folly. Flying by the seat of your pants. Not accountable to God for anything. And suddenly, everything turns. Like Jesus turned the tables upside down at the temple. Instantly. Look at this. The anger. Here is the word to... It's the word to growl. And it solidifies the image of the king and the lion who doesn't pick or choose when he's hungry. Let me just let you in on a little inside baseball. Uh, the lion sitting up on the hill in the shade looking down upon the various and sundry animals, and he doesn't say to his companions, you know, I think today I'm going to take a zebra. I had, I've had water buffalo all week. I don't think he thinks like that. No, let me tell you about the nature of the lion. This is the way God made them. When they're hungry, they become angry. And it takes over every aspect of their existence. That's the lion. Look at the end of your proverb. Forfeits his life. Literally, it is to miss the life. The dreadful roar is no empty threat. The fool should take this to heart. And so I am going to speak to you and to myself as a reminder of what this proverb really means to you and me as New Testament believers. It means repent. Repent right now in this moment. In the quietness of your heart, repent. You see, Peter tells us that men have been deluded. That's 2 Peter 3.9. They, they think that the Lord is really slow in keeping His promise. That it's going to be the summer, and then it's going to be the fall, and then it's going to be the winter again. And we're just going to keep rolling this thing along. And Peter reminds us, no, it's not that way at all. See, what men have missed is that we're living in a parenthesis. We're in, we're in the eye of the hurricane. It's all calm. Everything's peaceful. Strike a match and it just burns. No problem. Dr. Johnson preaching in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. It's the prayer from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Dr. Johnson pointed out, it's a prayer for time. It's a prayer for peace, for tranquility. You see, men just took the Son of God and killed Him. The Son came into the orchard of the Father and the servants killed Him. And the Father now has all the penal justice He needs to obliterate them. And the Son hanging upon the cross Ask His Father, wait. Be patient. 
a parenthesis so that you and I would have time to realize what we did and come to the knowledge of the truth. We live in a parenthesis, but make no mistake, said Peter. The backside of the hurricane is coming. You don't hear it from heaven. You hear it from the Scriptures. It is the roar of a lion. He left as a lamb, a spotless lamb. When He returns, He will take His inheritance. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And there will be no place to run. There'll be no place to hide. And on that day, make no mistake, there'll be no repentance. No, that day has come and gone. The parenthesis is over. Then it's a day of judgment. Now you are all alone and you're facing the lion. Hear his roar this morning. I came to Believer's Chapel. It was Mother's Day. I was in a Sunday school class. But for the first time in my life, I heard the roar of the lion and the implications of what that was to my life. And I repented for my life and I made sure, absolutely certain, that I had a relationship with Jesus the Christ. Because my friends, He is coming back. And He is coming back as the lion that would make us all tremble. May God give us the grace to hear His Word and respond to the time that He has given us. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for uh, the study of the Proverbs today. Thank You for Believer's Chapel, for the Word of God that is centered here Lord, we have, through these elders, taught it as it has been appropriated, the learning for the living, to think and act biblically. Content. Content that changes our lives and ultimately leads us to our destiny. And that's with You. We thank You and praise You for all that You have done for us and for the wisdom of Your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen.